In this video, let's talk about the overinvestation of voice dubbing in Chinese drama land. Hi, you're watching Avenue X, where junkie on good storytelling shares her thoughts, knowledge, and occasional weird ideas on stories and how they're told. If you've been a long-time subscriber to my channel, you probably have seen that video, which I made quite a long time ago, talking about this issue. But I thought it's a good idea to refresh that video, also because I've got more subscribers since then, and I often see this type of comments under my videos talking about why do they dub. So today in this video, let me tell you why it is done from all the angles. I can possibly see. This year so far has been a really painful year for a Chinese drama reviewer such as me. One big reason being a lot of dramas came out, almost twice as many as last year. And among that many dramas, a lot got dubbed. I am personally a huge fan of voice acting. I do my own dubbing, so if you're curious, you can uh, check out that video. I'll leave the link in the description, which is me dubbing. I'm very sensitive to people's voice. I recognize most of the prominent voice actors, actors voice in China almost instantly when they speak, to the point where it starts to impede my enjoyment of dramas. This year, nobody tops my pain <laughs> than the voice actor Wei Chao. I love his voice. I have no problem with his voice or this person. But it just happens to be this year, for all the dramas I've seen, so many of them featured him playing one of the major roles in the drama, dubbing the male lead or the male second lead or something like that. I haven't even gotten out of the previous drama of one actor acting with his voice. Then the next drama comes up and his voice is there. Wei Chao has a very beautiful voice. He is the voice for the radio play version of the Untamed, the Mo Dao Zu Shi, Lan Wang Ji. He is also the um, voice actor who dubbed Xiao Jing Rui, the role from the Varna in Fire by the actor Cheng Feng or Cheng Hao Feng, I think he changed his name. His voice fits the actor's face very much so that later in this year, Winter Begonia, when the same actor played a supporting role, Wei Chao also lent his voice. So for me, visually, the strongest impression Wei Chao's voice has been fed into is Cheng Feng or Cheng Haofeng's face. And that becomes a problem because this year, so many dramas male lead has been dubbed by the voice actor Wei Chao. And as much as he tried to make each person sound a little bit differently, there's a limit of how far your voice can go and how much you can change it. So this year, the beautiful voice of Wei Chao's has been used on the faces of Cheng Feng, Zhang Yao, Qing Hao, Jiang Chao, Zhang Zhehan, Dou Xiao, Lai Yi, Zhou Tingwei. It got to the point where I just cannot watch any dramas that features another actor that uses his voice because in my head, I literally see that actor and then I see all the other actors who have had the same voice in their dramas multiplied like in Photoshop on each other on top and it's a mess. I have nothing against the voice actor. I just absolutely hate the fact that these days in Chinese drama land, getting a professional voice dubber to dub the real people has become a norm and it's wrong. So now let's get Getting to the real important part of this video is why. There was a time when this kind of thing just does not exist. Actors use their own voice in films, in television. The dubbing actors usually just dub animation, documentary, narrative voice, that type of thing. It is your job as an actor or actress to speak your lines, to use your own voice. It's a part of your performance. Today we're mostly talking about television, but we do have to talk about a particular situation in the film land that kind of started the whole thing. From the early 2000s, a lot of films start to get made as collaboration films between the mainland crew and somebody from Hong Kong or from Taiwan. When you make that type of films, you come across a big problem is everybody speaks with a different accent. For all the Chinese speaking people in the world, it's very easy to tell if you have a mainland Mandarin standard accent or if you're from Hong Kong or you're from Taiwan and it's very distinctive. Often you come across those type of productions such as period dramas that's set like 2000 years ago. It's not like people can fly 2000 miles at that time, right? To meet each other. You pretty much all grew up in the same region. You would have logically speaking the same accent, but because actors come from different places, their accents are so not synced. It will take people out of the story. So for those type of productions, they start to use voice dubbing. You also see that happening in Dramaland where mainland actors 
actors from Taiwan, actors from Hong Kong work in the same production, making a story that supposedly happened in the same location of whatever setup. Logically speaking, they would be speaking similar, at least, accent. Here, I would also uh, explain a little bit more about the Mandarin Chinese. Chinese language as a written form has been around for thousands of years, and it has been very well preserved throughout generations. But in terms of the sound of it, it has gone through many, many, many changes. And it organically develops and grows into its own different styles depending on what region you're living in, resulting in hundreds and hundreds of dialect that's based on Chinese but having their local vocabularies very different sound system. So what we consider to be the standard Chinese Mandarin where um, all the TV hosts, the news broadcaster use today is designed really, a middle of last century roughly, and it's based on a particular dialect in the region in China that's around Chengde. Because if it's very standard and not having too many local vocabulary sounds sort of quality gets picked to be the standard accent and start to get widely distributed, helping people to understand each other. Even though it's been around for over half a century, not everybody is equally well taught in Mandarin. For example, I went through a particular type of training when I was little for a performance on stage. Because of that, I can speak very good Mandarin. But then there are people who never got that training. And when they grow up in their schools, uh, the school may not be very strict and the teachers may be not that good at Mandarin. Mandarin, so they grew up having a sort of semi-mixed, not perfect Mandarin and having their local accent. The younger you are these days in China, the chances are you have better Mandarin. Also, the more metropolitan you grow up in bigger cities, good education, you tend to have really good Mandarin. The further you go into the countryside, the older people get, they have less understanding and ability to speak Mandarin. So it is in China's interest to promote Mandarin so that people can communicate easily. Because of that, Chinese films, Chinese dramas are always made with characters speaking perfect Mandarin. Depending on where you are, what your mother tongue is, you may not have that bit of a problem in terms of people from different regions speaking drastically different dialect. But in China, that's the case. I'll give you an example so you understand how different things can be and why Mandarin is important. If you want to say, I've got a good deal, so you go out buy something and it's a good bargain, how do you express that? Well, in Mandarin, you may say, this deal is very hua suan. You get a really good value for the money you pay. If you're speaking with my local dialect, Chongqing dialect, it will be literally means you've picked up something soft, which means you would have to pay more, but now you get it easy. And then if you're from Shanghai, you may say, very, is Hua Suan's Shanghai dialect version. So you have Hua Suan, Jian Pa Ho, Gesu, expressing the same thing. And they're in three different dialects of Chinese. How are you ever supposed to find out what it means if you are not educated in that particular dialect and you're from a different place, which is why Mandarin is important. That will lead me to talk about the first situation, why certain actors have to get dubbed. Reason one, the actors do not speak good Mandarin. One particular type of that is the actor is from a different place, such as from Taiwan or Hong Kong as compared to mainland, where you would have very different standard accent. And if you're playing a character who's actually from mainland, then it doesn't make sense for you to speak with that strong accent. There Therefore, you get dubbed by a professional Mandarin speaking dubbing actor or actress. The other subtype is the actor himself or herself just cannot speak good standard Mandarin even when they are from say mainland. And it doesn't happen that often these days, but it still happens. There are a couple of people I can think of who are young actors but who first haven't gone through proper academy training so that they don't speak really good Mandarin. And also, they didn't go through the training, so they don't quite know how to project voices. Screen acting is a little bit different from theater acting. You don't have to project it that much, and if you do, it actually sounds unnatural. But there's still an underlying principle in terms of how you use your voice. You also have to consider the balance between different actors. If one of the actors in the main cast is really good, it will just make the other person who's not so good looking even worse. I don't want to point out the names, but <laughs> I have quite a few people on my list. Dub him. Don't let him speak. Oh, dub her, don't let her speak, because that line delivery will totally ruin my drama experience. The second type may be something that you have never thought about, which is restrictions due to shooting conditions. For contemporary dramas, it's much easier to record on set, and if you have 
certain things that doesn't work quite well, there's noises, the quality is problematic, you go to ADR post-production and then record that particular bit and it's solved. Because for contemporary dramas, it often it takes place in a residential building or in an office, this type of place, it's easy to control the sound. So you often see for contemporary dramas, it's more likely to have actors using their own voice, although sometimes dubbing still happens. But for period dramas, it's a big problem trying to get perfect on-set recording due to two kind of reasons. One is a lot of the period dramas are shot in Yung Shi Cheng. You can understand it as a built up big set. The most famous one for period drama in China is in Heng Dian. You probably have heard that many times when I do my videos. Like 90% of the period dramas you see will have similar sets that's shot in the same place that's in Heng Dian. For those places, they're designed to be rented out to crews to film dramas. It is also a kind of theme park. And if you're filming a particular scene at a particular set today, well, that set gets closed off for your crew, but everywhere else outside, people are walking around, having fun, running around, wild kids, whatever. The problem with that is you cannot control the tourists. So if you're recording somebody talking and then a hundred meter outside of that set, somebody starts to scream as a tourist, your recording is ruined. And if you wanna get perfect clean recording, sometimes you have to wait. You stretch the schedule longer. Every day you spend on set and people filming is extra day of food, of accommodation, of renting equipment, hundreds and thousands of dollars going out every day. So to save money, often when you film period dramas, you still have on-set recording, but it's used to refer later in post-production when people start to put dubbing voice onto it so that they match. And there's another type that's even more ridiculous, but it's very, very real, which is if you're filming a particular period drama that needs a set that's designed and built for the drama, not already existing in a place, you run into a problem of scheduling. I've seen period dramas renting a huge studio that has all the light control in it so that you can design it to be night, day, whatever. But to make it function at the highest possible efficiency, they cut the studio in two. On one half, they've already built a particular set and they film all the things that take place in the set. First, all the things from episode 1 to 40 that takes place in this particular room gets filmed. And while they're doing that, the construction workers are building another set on the other half. So once they've finished filming this, that is also newly built, they move and then start to film that set. And then they dismantle this side and build it into a third set. By doing that, they can make the schedule tight and save money. But because of that, while you're filming here, the other side is dong, 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 constructing. I'm pretty sure in 2017, when 10 Miles of Peach Blossoms was super popular, there were leaked footages of the drama, or raw footage, no color grading, green screen that's leaked online, even having the time code that's like used for censorship, whatever. The actors are actually speaking the lines, but in that recording, there's just construction noises going on because there's another set that's been built off camera and they have no choice. That's the only way they can get the drama filmed within budget. Whether you use the actual actor actress's voice or you get dubbing actor actresses, you have to do it in post-production. So that's the second major reason. Due to restrictions of production condition, you have to use dubbing. The third reason why this happens is also to do with money, but it's to do with post-production budget. All productions want to save money. That's normal business. And the fact is hiring professional dubbing actor and actresses are much much, much more efficient, cheaper for the production than using the original actor and actresses. It's like any other type of profession. Practice makes perfect. For the dubbing actors and actresses, they do that every day for years and years. Their mandarins are impeccable. They have a lot of experience about how to fit their sound to the actors' faces. They also know all the tricks that they need to control their emotion, to fake crying, to control breathing, to make it sound natural, but not move to make any extra noise. It's like any other job. The more you do it, the better you get at it. So for a drama that's about 40, 50 episodes, period drama, and the leading roles who have most of the scenes in most of the episodes, if you are a very experienced voice dubber, you can literally 
go through all your lines in three days. So that means they only need to rent the recording studio for three days, the recording artist for three days, your food, you know, all the expense, you know, all paid just for three days. And usually dubbing actors, no matter how famous they are, the cost of hiring them is cheaper, 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 much cheaper than the famous big stars of dramas. If you have the actors and actresses who would come and do their own voice dubbing in post-production because on-set recording cannot be used for the reason I explained, well, first, they cannot go through the 50 episodes in three days because they are not trained professionally. They may take a day, a half a day more to get used to how it works recording a voice and fit onto your own picture. It's not something that happens naturally. You see that very clearly in this year's drama, the Ming Dynasty drama. One big reason that I don't enjoy the performance is they got post-production dubbing for the actors. It's the actor, the actress who dub themselves, yes. But you can so clearly tell they don't quite know how to dub it professionally. Either they're doing it overboard, too emotional, and the image doesn't quite match, or they're doing under, performing under when their emotion is a lot on screen, but the sound doesn't fit. Particularly for the actress Tang Wei, her dubbing herself just sounds so awful in that drama. And I know it's not how she acts, because I've seen her in films that's recorded on set, she sounds perfectly fine. But when she tried to dub herself, she overdo it too much that it just doesn't sound right. It's very common that the actual actress and actors, because they're not professional dubbers, they need a lot more time to go through their own performance. So it may take a week or two to dub something that professionals can dub three days. They are already more expensive than the dubbing actors, and it may actually not end up to be the ideal result because you can't force a person to become professional dubber within two weeks. It doesn't work like that. So for a lot of dramas, they really want to cut the cost, right? At every corner. And this is definitely a part that they think we can get away with. Just get a professional dubber. You know, it wouldn't sound too bad. Gets done really quickly. We can move on to the next thing. And post-production is unpredictable. It may be due to censorship, due to this and that reason, that when the rough cut comes out that you need to uh, record voice, it's a different time than they initially anticipated. And the actor that you need uh, who played this role and who should dub his or her own role now is filming a different drama 2,000 miles away on a set. It's just too much hassle and too much money. So that's pretty much all the reasons I can think of and I know of that exist in Chinese drama and resulting in so many live action dramas getting dubbing. I am no fan of that. I really want to hear the actual actor and actress's voice. The emotion in that, that's caught in that moment, can never be replaced. Also, actually, for the professional dubbing people, they don't really like to do live actions because they are really dancing with shackles on. They have to fit whatever other people's performance have done rather than having their own flair and own creativity. They actually all prefer doing radio play, animation films, or even documentary or certain types of audio product because it's their creativity. They have the freedom to do whatever they want. These days, drums are often made as commercial products and they have to make profit. When profit becomes the most important thing, you compromise. Sound gets ignored because people just think visual is the most important thing. But as a YouTuber and also as a YouTube watcher, you know how important the sound is. I mean, my video can be a 720p video and it wouldn't really impede your enjoyment on a phone or on an iPad. But if my sound sound like crap, you just would not want to watch it. And for acting, voices is just so important. I, I don't understand why people just don't see how essential it is to the quality, to the believability, to the groundedness, to the visceral energy of acting that the sound needs to be the actual sound that the actor made at the time. And then we also have actors and actresses who have such beautiful natural voice. Zhou Xun's voice, so unique. There's no second person that sound like her in Chinese drama film land. Wang Kai's voice I just recently talked about. Oh, I can literally swim in his voice forever. Why would you ever want to dub them, right? Like their own voices is the best thing ever. So pray <laughs> for Chinese drama land. If you're a big Chinese drama watcher and you have suffered as much as I have, or maybe even just half as much as I have, let's just pray that we will get fewer and fewer dubbed dramas in the future. And I think as audiences, we deserve the honest representation of people's performances. And also I think for the actors and actresses who have ambitions, you know, of their professional career and who have any type of professional integrity should use their own voice. If you can't do it well, well, get a teacher, get trained, you know, like practice makes perfect. I couldn't speak perfect Mandarin when I was born and I learned it. It's not that difficult. You're Chinese already. <sighs> okay. So, 
that's the end of this video. Thank you for watching. I have new eggs. I hope it has answered some of your long-held questions about why dubbing is so prevalent in Chinese Romland. I'll see you in my next video. Meanwhile, live long and happy drama watching.